Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our third lecture in our course on brain and behavior. Uh, and in this lecture, we'll talk about the large-scale structure of the nervous system. Uh, so we've already talked about neurons, how neurons are built, what they look like, what their parts are, and, and we'll do basically the same thing, but at the larger scale, the visible scale. Uh, so we're going to talk about the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous systems. Uh, the brain and the spinal cord together are known as the central nervous system, or CNS, and the peripheral nervous system is basically everything else. Uh, so we're going to talk about the structure of all of those things, and that's a fair amount of content. Uh, so this lecture is going to be a little bit longer uh, than our usual lectures. Okay, before we get to this week's new content, uh, first I want to go over last week's quizzes. Uh, so performance, generally very good. Um, and so keep up the good work. Be sure to take those quizzes by Friday nights. Uh, but again, everyone for the most part did very well. Uh, so I'll go over the most commonly missed questions. Uh, so from the first quiz, um, one of the most commonly missed questions was about that distinction between uh, neurological and psychological disorders. Uh, and that hinges on this figure from your book where there are two different pie charts, one for neurological and one for psychiatric disorders, as, it, as it's called. Uh, and, and as I pointed out in lecture, that distinction uh, is, is a little bit misleading. Uh, and, and the reason uh, is that these things are all based in the brain. And the things that are listed as neurological just happen to be things we understand a little bit more about. We know what a stroke is. We know what causes the symptoms of a stroke. Uh, we know what causes the symptoms of epilepsy. Uh, we know less about what causes mood disorders or anxiety disorders. Uh, and so this distinction between neurological and psychiatric uh, isn't so much a real scientific or biological distinction. Uh, it's really just an indicator of how much we know about each category. Uh, so as I mentioned also, things that are on this right side of the diagram will, as time goes on, hopefully shift over to the left until everything is on the left. Everything, even if it still occurs, even if it's not curable, uh, will become something that we understand the biology for. So that's why that distinction is a little artificial. Uh, another commonly missed one was about tunicates and why they quote unquote eat their own brain. Uh, we, we explained why that was a little bit inaccurate, uh, but the idea there is that you need a brain to sense the environment and respond to it. And once tunicates enter that second phase of their life cycle, they no longer need to do that. They're not going to be able to move around. They are attached to a rock or something stationary for the rest of their lives. Uh, there's no meaningful sense in which can, they can respond to their environment. So there's no sense in which they really need a brain. So that's the answer there. And then phrenology. What did phrenology do for us? Uh, and, and phrenology was sort of a hoax. Uh, it doesn't work. And yet, the point of phrenology at its core uh, is that different parts of the brain do different things. Uh, and while phrenologists got those functions completely and totally wrong, uh, and certainly got how to measure those differences completely and totally wrong, what they got right was the idea that different parts of the brain have different jobs. And, and that idea had been around for centuries. But phrenology, if nothing else, at least promoted that idea. Okay, for the second quiz, uh, chemical synaptic transmission versus electrical. Uh, and this is something we went, went over in our second lecture of the week. Uh, and, and that is that, that chemical synaptic transmission is slower. Uh, electrical transmission is very fast. It's, it's uh, just the time it takes for ions to flow through little channels between neurons. Uh, so it's about as fast as the action potential itself. Why spend the time and energy converting that action potential into a chemical signal just to convert it back to an electrical one? And the answer is that chemical synaptic transmission is in many ways flexible. Uh, so you can release a little bit of a chemical or less. Uh, you can vary the number of receptors that are on the postsynaptic side. Uh, you can modulate a neuron's response to that signal. You can produce more or less of it. Uh, and so there are ways to sort of change the impact of that signal. Whereas with electrical transmission, whatever 
electrical charge that gets to that axon terminal is just what's going to go into the presynaptic side, uh, excuse me, the postsynaptic side of the next neuron. Uh, so chemical synaptic transmission, uh, you can modify the signal. You can boost it, and that's something else that's important. Electrical transmission, after it goes through a few neurons, is so attenuated uh, that it sort of dies. And so chemical transmission, every time a new neuron picks up that chemical signal, uh, it gets sort of made again. Uh, and speaking of that, the distinction between presynaptic and postsynaptic, uh, this can be a tricky one. Uh, and, and the thing to remember here is which way information is going. We know, for our purposes, uh, that information flows from the dendrite to the cell body to the axon to the axon terminal of a neuron. Uh, and it goes from the axon terminal to the dendrite of the next neuron. And often this connection is between an axon terminal and a dendritic spine, a little projection off of a dendrite. Uh, and so the side that is sending the information is presynaptic. It's where the axon terminal is. It's where mitochondria are. It's where synaptic vesicles are. Uh, so it's the side that's sending the information. It gets the information first. It is presynaptic. Uh, the dendritic spine is on the postsynaptic side. It's picking up the information. It, it is receiving it. It gets it second. And that can be a hard thing to remember, presynaptic versus postsynaptic, but it's very important. So go back and study that if you had trouble with that area. And then neural structures, uh, the difference between unipolar, bipolar, multipolar. Uh, and, and really the key here is, is simple. And it's just how many things are sticking off of the neuron. Uh, so in this diagram from your book, uh, the rightmost cell is unipolar. Only one thing is sticking off the cell body. It later branches, but just count how many things are coming off the cell body. Uh, for this middle neuron, it is bipolar. It has a dendrite sticking off at one end and an axon sticking off the other. And then multipolar on the left. You have one axon and many dendrites. Uh, and so all you have to do is just count the number of things sticking off of the cell body. If it's one, it's unipolar. If it's two, it's bipolar. If it's more than two, it's multipolar. Okay, and then last week's discussion, uh, there were three questions. One was, are synapses built right, so to speak? Uh, and again, we have this idea of chemical and electrical synapses. Uh, chemical synapses, the gap between neurons, is tens of nanometers, usually around 40 nanometers, which is, of course, tiny for our standards, but Electrical synapses are even tinier. Uh, we're talking about four nanometers. So why are the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons so far apart for chemical synapses when they obviously could be closer? Uh, and the answer is that it seems that, that is, it is sort of tuned that way evolutionarily. Certainly mutations at some point had synapses that were farther apart. Some would have mutations that made them closer together, but this seems to be the optimal distance. Why? Uh, well, if you make them closer together, then anything released of that presynaptic neuron is going to get picked up and cause a signal in the postsynaptic one. Uh, and in a sense, that means you can't take anything back. And presynaptic neurons accidentally fire all the time. Uh, and so by spacing it a little farther apart than that, uh, you lose some time. It's not going to be as quick. You have to wait for diffusion of the neurotransmitter across the cleft. Uh, but you're also not going to respond perhaps to a single mistaken vesicle release. Uh, on the other side, you're not going to, you don't want them farther apart uh, because it will take longer uh, and also because legitimate signals might get lost. Uh, there are little machines that pull neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic side or chew it up. Uh, and so if you make them too far apart, that postsynaptic side might never receive the signal. So it's a balance uh, between false alarms and missing legitimate signals. Uh, and the second question was about applications of our contents. We already talked about uh, neurological, psychological disorders. Uh, and also, the content we discuss in this course uh, has basic science applications. We don't know how the brain works. We want to fix that. So we're going to study the brain. Uh, and so even if we don't have an immediate application in mind, it's not a particular disease we're trying to cure or treat, uh, more often than not, in basic science, you solve a question that you might just say is something you're pursuing out of curiosity, uh, but it turns out to be important later.
And so the question is beyond that, beyond basic science and beyond immediate treatment, what good does it do us to study this information? Uh, and the fact is that, that this helps everybody. Uh, understanding your own behavior is helpful. Understanding other people's behavior, uh, where it's coming from, why they have the responses they do, why there's variance between people in terms of responses and whether it's emotions, whether it's interpersonal interactions, uh, whether it's response to drugs or medication. Uh, understanding this stuff helps us understand each other, uh, and especially when it comes to mental disorders. So obviously understanding the brain uh, may help us find a cure for a mental disorder or a treatment for a mental disorder, uh, but by understanding the biology, we also uh, mitigate the risk of making the same mistake that was made in the past, uh, which was attributing the mental disorder uh, to the fault of the person, whether they are, it's because they're of weak moral character or they're possessed by demons or spirits. Uh, the more we understand about the brain, the more we get away from supernatural thinking, from blaming the person that has the mental disorder, from stigmatizing them. Uh, and so that helps not just the person with the disorder, it helps everybody. Uh, and then our last question was about our topics, the range of topics we're gonna be covering. Uh, and in particular, about cause and effect. And this is an important topic for this course as a whole. Understanding cause and effect. What causes certain behaviors? What causes certain physiological responses? And the question here was, what do you think is the hardest to connect here? Uh, and the topics we'll cover, there's a range of difficulty. And some of this may seem counterintuitive, but uh, topics like the effects of drugs, uh, that one we understand pretty well in terms of cause and effect. Uh, mental disorders such as schizophrenia. We don't know everything about schizophrenia. There's a lot to learn, but we know some of the things. Uh, we know some ways that the brains are different. Uh, we know that cell loss occurs at a higher rate. We know that neurons are disorganized in certain areas of the brain. Uh, we know, in the case of drugs, we know what the drugs are. We can analyze them chemically. Uh, we often, in most cases, know which neurons they bind to, which receptors. Uh, and so those cause and effect relationships aren't as difficult to discern as they might initially seem. Uh, what is hard, things like consciousness, things like emotions, uh, things that are really subjective. Uh, the physiological response to drugs, you can test pretty easily. Uh, the cognitive responses in schizophrenia, uh, deficits, we can measure those more easily. Uh, measuring self-awareness so far is not possible. Uh, and so those are really the topics that are hard to determine in cause and effect. Uh, those that, that are hard to define, those that are subjective. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind moving forward. We'll see that, that some topics we know more about than others. Uh, but okay, uh, good discussion this last week. So keep it up in the future. Remember that you need to uh, contribute a total of eight times during the course of the semester. Okay, so by way of overview, this is what we're going to be doing in this lecture. Uh, so we're looking at the nervous system from a, a structural perspective. Uh, we're going to talk some about function in terms of what different parts of the nervous system do, uh, but we're not going to understand how the nervous system does these things uh, until a later lecture, uh, because we don't understand how neurons work yet. We'll get to that later. Uh, so for now, we're going to learn different parts of the nervous system and we'll describe what they do sort of psychologically or physically, um, but we don't understand how that information processing works yet. So we'll just go with that for the moment. Uh, one thing we're gonna do is navigate the human brain. Uh, and the human brain is really complicated. One of the things that makes it complicated is the fact that it, it's an unfamiliar thing to us and it's a three-dimensional structure. And of course, the way the, the, the materials work uh, is that you have 2D images. Uh, and, and so we're going to get some geographical coordinates, as we'll see. Uh, we're going to learn about some different structures in the brain, learn their names, certainly, uh, but also learn why they're grouped together. Uh, sometimes it's geographic, they happen to be close together, uh, but sometimes it's functional, they, they have a, a job in common. 
Uh, we're going to look at the spinal cord as well, not for a long time, uh, but we'll, we'll look at one particular function of the spinal cord, and that is reflexes. Uh, we'll also see just generally that the spinal cord transfers information from the brain uh, to most of the rest of the body. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a broad description of what it does. Uh, and then we'll look sort of briefly at the peripheral nervous system. Uh, we have the entire rest of the course and the senses unit in particular uh, to talk about particular parts of the peripheral nervous system, particular parts of the body. Uh, and so we're not going to dwell on that very much here. Uh, this again is, is sort of an overview and we'll contrast it uh, with the central nervous system. So what we're going to do is get our bearings. Uh, again, the brain is a three-dimensional structure, so we're going to learn some terms. Uh, we're going to learn the names of directions when we're referring to the brain. We don't say things like front, back, left, right, up or down, uh, because these things can change based on your perspective, what, what direction you're looking at the brain from. Uh, so we have some terms that are anatomically specific uh, that are sort of universal, that let us speak a common language about different parts of the brain. Uh, and we'll look at the names of some specific structures. So this is not a neuroanatomy course. Uh, we do need to know some neuroanatomy, though, in order to understand the psychological functions we'll talk about for the rest of the course. So we have to know some structures. It's not going to be an exhaustive list. That is not the point. Uh, but there are certain structures that will be mentioned again and again, and so we're going to introduce them here. Uh, and then we'll talk about some jobs that the nervous system does. Uh, in our first lecture, we gave an overview of what it what it means to have a nervous system, why have one. Uh, and now we'll get a little more specific. Uh, some divisions within the peripheral nervous system, some of the things different parts of the brain do. Uh, so we'll go into a little bit of detail there. And again, as we go through the course, we'll go into even more detail. So this is a, a, just a gentle introduction uh, to different parts of the brain, different parts of the nervous system, uh, and roughly speaking, what job they do. Uh, and we will compare the central and peripheral nervous systems. Uh, we will look at what makes the two different, what's the dividing line, uh, but also what different properties do they have. Uh, as we'll see, the central nervous system is not very good at repairing itself, while the peripheral nervous system is. Uh, and we'll look, a, a look at why that is. So broadly, the, the nervous system uh, can be divided into the central nervous system, and the peripheral nervous system, uh, often just referred to as the CNS and the PNS. Uh, the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord and a couple of what are called cranial nerves. More on that later. Uh, the peripheral nervous system is everything else. Uh, it's the nerves and neurons uh, that leave the spinal cord and go to the rest of the body. So this diagram from your book uh, on the left, you see this sort of cartoon representation uh, where you have the central nervous system, just the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, the entire rest of the body. Uh, on the right side of this diagram, you see, this is not a cartoon, this is an actual image of a preserved brain and spinal cord. You see the brain, the spinal cord, which together are the CNS, uh, and at the bottom, you see a structure labeled the cauda equina. Uh, this is a bunch of nerves that exit the, the bottom of the spinal cord. Uh, we'll see this, this root word, C-A-U-D-A, -A, cauda, uh, in a few different contexts. Uh, what it means is tail. And equina here, if you've heard the term equine or equestrian, uh, refers to horse. Uh, now, obviously, this is a human nervous system. Uh, it's called that because where those nerves exit, they sort of exit in a bundle. Uh, and it looks like a horse's tail. So it's called the horse's tail, or cauda equina, because a lot of terms are in Latin. Uh, some terms we'll see come from Greek, some come from Latin, um, and a lot of that is just because of the history of neuroscience. Uh, anyway, that's why, that's what that label means. Uh, for now, the distinction between the CNS and the PNS is what we care most about. Uh, so here's an image of the brain. Uh, and we're going we're to introduce some basic terms first. So this is the outside of the brain, or what we call the cortex. Uh, and the cortex is divided into lobes. Uh, 
Uh, so here we are looking at the brain from the left side. We're looking at what is called the left hemisphere, the left half of the brain. Uh, so your brain has two hemispheres, just like the world has two hemispheres, uh, the east and west or north and south. It's just a way of dividing things in half. Uh, within each hemisphere, you have four lobes, and they are labeled here on this diagram from your book. Uh, so on the left, you have the frontal lobe. And that, as it sounds, comes in the, is located in the front of the brain. Uh, just behind it, so moving to the right on this diagram, we are looking at the person from the side. Uh, just behind the frontal lobe is the parietal lobe. Uh, and so it is just behind uh, the frontal lobe, but it is just in front of the occipital lobe. Uh, the occipital lobe showed here the rightmost portion of this diagram. Uh, as it turns out, your occipital lobe uh, is what does your visual processing. Uh, almost all of your occipital lobe consists of your visual cortex. Uh, as humans, we depend highly on vision, and so we have a lot of our brain devoted to visual processing. So the occipital lobe does that. Uh, the parietal lobe is involved in integrating the senses. Uh, so we'll see one example here in a moment. Uh, it's heavily involved in the sense of touch, uh, but it coordinates other senses as well. Uh, it's also involved in attention, which we won't talk about until toward the end of the course. Uh, the frontal lobe, uh, again, is something we'll talk about later in the course, but we'll mention it again and again. Uh, it, it is involved in reasoning, planning, decision-making, uh, and th these are functions that, that are perhaps present, not, not present only in humans, but are certainly uh, what humans are best at relative to other animals, our ability to reason, uh, to inhibit impulses, to make long-term plans. Uh, and, and so these are housed in the frontal lobe, and this is why the frontal lobe is proportionally larger in humans. Uh, humans do not have the largest brains in the animal kingdom, uh, but relative to our body size, our brains are pretty big, uh, and relative to our body size, our frontal lobe is particularly big. Uh, and again, we think that the frontal lobe is what gives us a lot of our advanced cognition. Uh, the fourth lobe is the temporal lobe, uh, and it's sort of off to the side of the brain. It's like the, the brain has little arms. The, the temporal lobes kind of wrap around the sides of the brain. Uh, and so the temporal lobe does a number of things, as all these lobes do. Uh, the temporal lobe is perhaps most notable for processing auditory information. Uh, so it is critical for your sense of hearing. So those are the lobes. Uh, other terms that will come up again and again are gyrus. Uh, so if you look at this brain, it has a wrinkled exterior. Uh, there are these sort of bumps and valleys. Uh, a bump or a hill on this diagram is referred to as a gyrus. It's the parts of the cortex that stick out. Uh, and that's in contrast to a sulcus. Uh, the plural of sulcus is sulci. So the sulci are the valleys. Uh, so you have all these wrinkles. The parts that stick out are the gyri. Uh, the valleys are the sulci. Uh, also in this diagram, you see these dotted lines. Uh, one of them is a special sulcus called the central sulcus. Uh, it divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Uh, the other one is called the sylvian fissure, and it divides the temporal lobe from the frontal and parietal lobes. So they're special insofar as they divide the lobes. Uh, also, and you can't see it on this diagram, unfortunately, because we're looking from the side, uh, there is a fissure that divides the left hemisphere from the right. Uh, so it sort of runs down from the very front to the very back of the head uh, and divides the brain into left and right hemisphere. So it sort of runs down the middle. Uh, and that's called the longitudinal fissure. Uh, so as an example, look at one of these gyri. Uh, so the somatosensory cortex uh, is also known as the postcentral gyrus uh, because it is just posterior, we'll learn that term in a moment, to the central sulcus. So it is the frontmost part of the parietal lobe. And this is what deals with your sense of touch. So on the left side here, uh, we see where this gyrus is relative to the rest of the brain. In the middle, we've broken this gyrus down. Uh, each part of that gyrus, each little zone, 
corresponds to a different part of the body. Uh, so, for example, the part of this gyrus that represents your hand is in the middle. And so if something touches your hand, uh, neurons in the middle of this gyrus will become active. If something touches your foot, uh, neurons at the end of the gyrus will become active. And so there's sort of a map. And we'll come back to this idea when we get to our unit on the census. Uh, on the far right, we have this interesting looking little person called a homunculus. Uh, and you'll notice that the por proportions are a bit off. This does not look like a typical person does. Uh, the person has very large hands, very large lips, and tongue. Uh, and so what this is, uh, this is what a person would look like if the size of their body parts corresponded to the representation on this gyrus. So the hand area of the gyrus is very big. Uh, the lip part of the gyrus is very big relative to the size of our actual lips. Uh, the leg portion is not very big, even though relative to our body size, our legs are a fair amount of our volume. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, it means that our hands are very sensitive. Our lips are very sensitive. We're good at telling the difference in stimuli that are on our lips and hands uh, because of our need to speak and to touch things respectively. Uh, so this is how things are represented in the brain. And while they're laid out as sort of a map of the body, uh, their size does not necessarily uh, correspond to the size of the actual body part. It corresponds to the sensitivity of that body part to touch. Similarly, we have motor cortex. It's just in front of somatosensory cortex. So somatosensory cortex is the frontmost part of the parietal lobe. Motor cortex is the backmost part of the frontal lobe. Uh, so here we see a sort of a slice of brain showing the motor cortex. We also see some, neur some cartoon neurons going down into the spinal cord. More on that in a minute. Uh, you also have a similar strip of tissue. This gyrus is laid out like your body is. And what's interesting uh, is that when you move a part of your body, say your leg, the corresponding part of this gyrus will become active. Those neurons will fire. Uh, this is a, a cartoon from the far side, uh, and you may not be able to read it in this video, uh, but if you look at the slides for this lecture, you should be able to see the caption. Uh, and this is a, a, a cartoon of brain surgery, and the doctor uh, is clearly poking the brain of the patient. The patient is kicking his leg up. Uh, and the doctor says, whoa, that was a good one. Try it, Hobbs. Just poke his brain right where my finger is. Uh, and so hopefully brain surgeons are not actually doing this during surgery and just for their amusement. Uh, but part of brain surgery is often mapping out the brain, determining which parts do what. Uh, not for basic research. We sort of know what different parts of the brain do broadly. Uh, but each patient is a little bit different. And so uh, surgeons actually often will stimulate different parts of the brain to determine exactly what their functions are uh, because everyone is a little bit different. Uh, it's typically done electrically with, a, with a, an electrical probe. It's not done by poking it with your finger, uh, but the principle is the same. By stimulating part of the brain, uh, you can cause those neurons to be active and they will exhibit their function. In this case, uh, the, the surgeon has stimulated the part of motor cortex that corresponds to the leg. So the patient's leg moves. So this is obviously a cartoon, but it, 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 it indicates a, a very real concept, uh, the correspondence between movement and stimulation of motor cortex. Uh, and you can construct a similar hom homunculus uh, for motor cortex. Uh, again, the hands are very big, the lips and tongue are very big because we need precise control uh, of our hands and our lips and tongue, uh, the hands to control objects and the lips and tongue for speech. Uh, you'll notice also that the eyes are fairly big because we need to precisely control our eyes, where our eyes are pointing. We're pretty good at precisely moving our eyes. Uh, in the previous diagram on the, on the somatosensory cortex, the eyes were small. Uh, remember that the somatosensory cortex is just your sense of touch, and the sense of touch for your eyes is not very good. We don't feel things with our eyes. Uh, so you don't need a very sensitive sense of touch in your eyeballs. Um, your sense of vision is very good. 
But that's not represented in your somatosensory cortex, that's in your occipital lobe. So that's the difference between your sense of touch and your sense of vision. Uh, also, you'll notice in this diagram uh, that the motor cortex sends neurons down to the spinal cord, and what I've highlighted here is the fact that they cross over. As I mentioned in our first lecture, uh, the left side of the brain controls and senses the right side of the body, and vice versa. And that's where this happens, in the brainstem. Uh, so for reasons we are not entirely sure of, uh, neurons cross over from one side to the other. Uh, so neurons that start in the left side of the brain will cross over and end up in the right side of the body, the right side of the spinal cord. And again, we don't know exactly why that is, but that's where this happens. Uh, okay, so those are a couple of examples. We've seen the lobes, uh, we've seen a couple of gyri and what they do, uh, and that's going to introduce us to our, our basic coordinates. Uh, but the brain is a complicated three-dimensional object, so we need to do a little bit more than that if we're going to be comfortable understanding different parts of the brain. Uh, so the trick is that images are two-dimensional, and so we need to look at multiple images, and we'll look at a lot of images of the brain today. Uh, looking at two dimensions, you need to know what perspective you're looking from. Uh, just like our first image of the brain, we were looking from the left side of the person. We need to know that in order to understand which parts of the brain are where. Uh, so there are what are referred to as anatomical planes. Uh, it's as though you sliced the brain from one direction to another. Uh, so in this diagram from your book, in the bottom left, you have what is called the horizontal plane. Uh, so if you were standing up, standing up on the floor, uh, the horizontal plane, if you sliced the brain uh, with a plane parallel to the floor, so this way, separating the top part from the bottom, that is the horizontal plane. So on this image in the bottom left, uh, you are looking, it's like you've taken off the top half of the brain, uh, and you are looking down at what remains. Uh, what's called the sagittal plane is in the middle. And that's a plane that divides the left half from the right. It's as though you sliced the brain uh, sort of into the left and right halves. Uh, and so you can pull them apart. And here we're looking at the right hemisphere. It's as though we have the whole brain, sliced it down the middle. We pull them apart, and now we're looking at the right half. Uh, so we're looking at the inner surface of the right hemisphere in this image. So that is the sagittal plane. It separates the left from the right halves. The horizontal plane separates the top from the bottom halves. And then on the right, you have the coronal plane. And that is a slice uh, that separates the front part from the back. So if you sliced the brain this way and pulled them apart, uh, and you could either discard the, the front or the back, and you'd be, you could look at the inner surface of whatever remains. Uh, so the coronal plane uh, slices between the front and back portions of the brain. Uh, by the way, there's an error in your textbook. So it refers to... Uh, the coronal plane as transverse, that's incorrect. Uh, transverse is actually the horizontal plane. I don't know why they did that. Uh, but it doesn't matter much because we're not going to use the term transverse in this course. I will use the term horizontal uh, and coronal. So the error is not that important, but it's worth noting. Uh, in addition to the planes, so we need that gives us the perspective, uh, which which side of the brain we're looking at, what direction we're looking from. Uh, but we can also refer to directions, relative locations. And so, for example, on the horizontal plane here, uh, you have, toward the left, you have the front of the person's brain. Toward the right, you have the back of the person's brain. Uh, these are referred to as anterior and posterior. Anterior means toward the front. Posterior means toward the back. Uh, and these are the, the front of the face and the back of the head. Uh, you also see in this diagram the terms rostral and caudal. I won't use those terms much, so they're not as important. But we see again that root word C-A-U-D-A, -A, cauda, meaning toward the tail. Humans don't have tails, but animals do. Uh, and so this is sort of a holdover from the animal literature. Uh, so we have anterior and posterior, meaning toward the front and toward the back, respectively. Uh, we also have dorsal and ventral. Uh, dorsal, if, you, if you've heard of the dorsal fin of a shark or dolphin, that is on the animal's back. Uh, now, dorsal for humans is toward the top of the head. Uh, ventral 
is toward the feet. And you might ask yourself reasonably, well, why is that? Dorsal means toward the back. Uh, why does dorsal mean the, toward the top of the head in humans? And it's because in humans, uh, our brains are sort of rotated 90 degrees uh, from most animals. Most animals, you have the head, and then coming off of that, you have the rest of the body of the animal. And so the brain is sort of in a line horizontally with the spinal cord. We stand upright. So our brain is in a line vertically with the spinal cord. So our brain is kind of rotated 90 degrees. Uh, so it's called dorsal to be consistent with animals. So dorsal means toward the top of the brain. Ventral means toward the bottom of the brain. Uh, there's some other terms we'll see every now and again. Uh, ipsilateral and contralateral. Uh, ipsilateral means on the same side. Contralateral means on the opposite side. So one side of the brain, motor cortex, controls the contralateral, cl contralateral side of the body, uh, the opposite side. So that's just, you'll, you'll see that term every now and again. I mean, it just means these two things are on the same side or opposite sides. And then superior and inferior. Uh, these refer not to quality. Doesn't mean that something is better if it's superior. Uh, these refer to directions. And superior means dorsal, it means up. Inferior means ventral, it means down. Uh, but we will see these terms, especially when referring to gyri. So you might see the superior temporal gyrus. That means it's a gyrus in the temporal lobe, and it's toward the top of the gyrus, or toward the top of the lobe. Uh, so it is the topmost gyrus of the temporal lobe. The inferior temporal gyrus is the bottommost gyrus in the temporal lobe. Uh, so those are some terms that will give us some, some coordinates. Uh, now we know what direction we're looking at the brain from. We can compare locations saying this structure is anterior to this structure. Uh, this other structure is superior to this other one. Uh, you'll also see the terms medial and lateral. And these are much easier. Medial means toward the middle. Lateral means toward the sides. So your brain is a midline. It's the longitudinal fissure that separates the left and right hemispheres. Uh, so medial means toward that midline. Lateral means away from the midline, off to the side. Uh, so we've seen some cartoons, uh, and we've also just seen some actual images of a brain. Uh, one other distinction, and I'll blow this image up, uh, is the difference between gray matter and white matter. If you look at the outer edges of this brain image, uh, you'll see that it's a little differently colored. Uh, and it is what is called gray matter. It is not literally gray in a real brain. Uh, inside that outermost edge is the white matter. It's brighter. And that's because white matter contains a lot of myelin. It's a material we saw in our unit on neurons. It coats the axons of certain neurons, not all neurons. Uh, so the neurons that are in gray matter on the outermost part of cortex don't have myelin. Uh, but the neurons that are inside the brain form white matter. They do have myelin. And the reason those inner neurons are myelinated is they have farther to go. On the very edge of the cortex, the gray matter, those neurons are talking to their close neighbors. Uh, but then they transfer information to neurons in white matter, and then those white matter neurons send their information across the brain. So it's a, it's a sizable distance relative to the size of a neuron. Uh, and so that myelin helps insulate the neuron, makes it transmit information faster, uh, because that long distance, speed matters. In gray matter, speed is not that important because it doesn't have very far to go. Uh, and so gray matter doesn't have myelin, white matter does. Uh, so if you look a little bit closer, we see that gray matter is not just sort of a uniform mishmash uh, of different neurons. It has organization. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor this here, uh, but if you take a microscope and you look at gray matter, it's organized into what are called cortical layers. So we look at the cortex, that gray matter layer on the outside of the brain, uh, and we see that the cell bodies, the soma, uh, of different neurons cluster together. They are not uniformly spread throughout. Uh, so they're formed into layers, and those layers talk to one another, and then sometimes they talk to a different layer. Uh, but there's an organizational scheme. Uh, and so if we see close-up images of cortex in the future, you can notice that these layers are present. There's organization to the brain. 
Uh, okay, so now we're going to look back at a cartoon. Uh, and if you'll notice, this is the sagittal plane. So we have sliced the brain sort of down the middle into left and right halves. We pull them apart, and we are now looking at the inner surface of the right hemisphere. So the front of the brain, the anterior end, is to the left in this diagram. The posterior end is to the right, that's the back. Uh, the top of the image is dorsal, it's toward the top of the brain. And the bottom of the image is ventral, it's the bottom of the brain. Uh, and the point here is not to memorize all these structures. I'll, I'll point out a few. Uh, for example, there's the corpus callosum, which is a sort of C-shaped structure in the middle of the brain. It's composed entirely of white matter, and it connects the left and the right hemispheres. So it allows those two hemispheres to communicate. And this is one of the few ways that the left and right halves of your brain are connected. Uh, you can, in fact, survive without a corpus callosum. Uh, some individuals are born without one. Uh, some individuals have it surgically cut to treat epileptic seizures that are spreading from one hemisphere to the other. Uh, you can survive just fine without it. Uh, it's only in very certain circumstances that symptoms appear, that you can tell that the corpus callosum is not intact. Uh, but it is the bridge between the left and right hemispheres. Uh, the thalamus, another important part of the brain. Uh, the thalamus is, is like the sensory routing center of the brain. Uh, all the senses, except for your sense of smell, send their information through the thalamus. Uh, so all that information comes in from other parts of the body, whether it's the eyes or the ears or the skin. All that information goes through the thalamus, and the thalamus is sort of like a switchboard operator. It connects that incoming information and sends it to whichever part of the brain it needs to go to. So the thalamus deals with sensory inputs. Uh, the cerebellum is this very wrinkly structure we see uh, on the posterior end of the brain, that is toward the right in this diagram, and it's on the ventral direction, it's on the underside of the brain. And the cerebellum deals with the balance and coordination. Uh, your fine motor movements depend on the cerebellum critically. Uh, the cerebellum, as we'll see in our unit on memory and learning, is also involved in classical conditioning, uh, learning connections between different events. Uh, so the cerebellum talks to lots of different parts of the brain, uh, and it's looking for connections. It's coordinating different parts of the body, coordinating different senses in a, in, in a way. Uh, and so that's what the cerebellum does. And then finally, the brainstem. Uh, the brainstem has subparts. I'm not going to go into the details here. Uh, the brainstem deals with your basic functions. It keeps you alive. It keeps your heart beating. It keeps you breathing. Uh, and so it's obviously a very important part of the brain. Uh, and that's why injuries to many parts of the brain uh, can be survivable if treated quickly enough. Uh, brainstem injuries are, are far more likely to be fatal because the brainstem handles those basic functions, what we call autonomic functions, uh, things that you don't have to think about, they're not under your conscious control, uh, but they are vital functions that keep you alive. Uh, the brainstem also contains structures that uh, are involved in sleep and wake cycles, uh, other basic functions that have to do with things like digestion. Uh, so it, it, it is your basic functions. And other animals have brain stems also. Uh, other animals have, in fact, all of these structures. Uh, but the size of the cortex, that outermost part, is what's so much bigger in humans. Uh, looking from a different perspective, so now this is the horizontal plane. We're looking at the brain from underneath. Uh, so the left side of this diagram is anterior, it's the front of the brain. The right side is posterior, just like it was in the previous diagram. Uh, but now the top part of this image is the left side of the brain. The bottom part is the right side. So it's like we're looking at it sort of from underneath and sideways. Uh, and so you can see the temporal lobes. Uh, on the left, you can see the frontal lobes. Uh, and on the right, you can see the cerebellum sitting underneath the occipital lobe. You can just barely see the occipital lobe uh, peeking out on the far right side. Uh, so this is just to give you a different view and, again, to familiarize you with the brain because it is a three-dimensional object. Uh, okay, so now we have some geography when it comes to the brain. Uh, and the brain has some important structures. Uh, one of these is called the basal ganglia, and this is a, co a collection of structures uh, that help you move around, that initiate actions, that select what things to do, basically. Uh, 
uh, and also process rewards. Uh, and so reward processing uh, and movement are, are connected. Uh, organisms try to pick actions that are rewarding, uh, whether it's seeking out food, finding a mate, uh, avoiding potential harm. Uh, actions are selected based on what they're going to yield, based on what the action will do for the organism. And so that's why these are, are functions that are similar in a way and are housed in the same structure in the basal ganglia. Uh, so here, I'm, we're not going to go through all of these structures. I'll point out a couple. Uh, one is the caudate nucleus, often just called the caudate. We see that root word again. Uh, and so this is a structure that has a tail on the end of it. That's why it's called caudate. Uh, and it is a notable part of the basal ganglia involved in reward processing and movement. I'll use it as sort of the exemplar of the basal ganglia. Uh, the other structure I'll mention here is the substantia nigra. Uh, and this is the, the Latin, this is Latin, uh, and what it really what it literally means is dark stuff. Substantia is the same basic word as substance. Uh, nigra uh, is a word meaning dark. Uh, and so substantia nigra just means dark stuff because early anatomists Notice that this was a dark spot in the brain when they opened up the brain and looked at it. Uh, so that's all that word means. What it does uh, is it helps uh, regulate the basal ganglia. Uh, and one thing it does is produce dopamine. So neurons that secrete dopamine uh, are found that are, are, have their origins in two different structures. One of them is the substantia nigra. Uh, and the reason I mention it here uh, is that the substantia nigra is where neurons die if one has Parkinson's disease. Uh, so Parkinson's disease is largely characterized by deficits in movement, difficulty initiating actions, uh, difficulty with smooth movement, muscle tremors. Uh, and this is because of the death of dopamine neurons in the basal ganglia and in the substantia nigra in particular. So an important structure uh, and it is one of two sources for dopamine neurons. Uh, here is a, 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 an actual image, not a cartoon. Uh, this is, again, a horizontal slice of the brain. So the left side is anterior, it's the frontal lobe. Right side is posterior, it's the occipital lobe. Uh, and we see the basal ganglia right here in the middle. And we, can all, we can also see it relative to other structures like the thalamus and the ventricles, which we'll get to in a minute. And we also see the difference between gray matter and white matter again. Uh, so this is to give you, again, some familiarity uh, with a two-dimensional slice of this three-dimensional structure. Uh, another collection of structures is called the limbic system. Uh, and this is uh, a group of brain regions uh, that are involved in emotional processing and evolved, and evolved in memory. Uh, and these are, again, processes that are connected. Emotionally powerful memories tend to be easier to recall. In fact, sometimes they can be too easy to recall. Uh, an individual with post-traumatic stress disorder uh, can find emotionally charged memories to be intrusive. Uh, those memories pop up when the person would prefer that they didn't. Uh, and there's a lot of debate as to whether the limbic system really des deserves the label of system, whether it really is a group of structures that all do the same thing. Uh, your book mentions it as the limbic system, so I'll stick with that. Uh, we're not, again, going to go through all of these structures. There are a lot of them on this diagram. Uh, two that I'll point out uh, are the amygdala and the hippocampus, because these are two structures that we will see again and again. Uh, the amygdala is heavily involved in emotional processing, especially the emotion of fear. Uh, we'll see in our unit on learning and memory that it's also involved in fear-based learning. Uh, the hippocampus is very important for memory. In particular, what we call declarative memory. More on that in a later lecture. Uh, but memories that we can describe, facts that we can recall, uh, locations that we can navigate to. These, all, these functions all depend heavily on the hippocampus. And so I'm pointing out these structures here. Uh, so they are sort of on the more ventral end of the brain, uh, but also on the medial side. So they're housed in the temporal lobe toward the middle, and the temporal lobe at this point is at the bottom of the brain. Uh, here's a diagram from your book. Uh, you can't really see the hippocampus here. It's not the right slice. This is a coronal slice. Uh, so we have 
sliced the brain into front and back halves, gotten rid of the back half, and now we're looking at the sort of inner surface of the front half. Uh, the amygdala is right here. Uh, and so it is toward the bottom of the brain, it is ventral. Uh, it's sitting sort of on top of the part of the temporal lobe that wraps underneath the brain. Remember, the temporal lobe, like those two arms that wrap around and underneath the brain. So this is where the amygdala is. Uh, I like this image a little better, but it's not in your book, so I'll add it here. Uh, in this case, here's the amygdala, again, sitting sort of on top of that part of the temporal lobe. And here is the hippocampus, sitting just underneath the amygdala. It's a sort of C-shaped structure. Uh, so this is, again, a coronal slice. It's the same slice as that previous image, but that slice uh, is just a little farther back. And so you can see the hippocampus here, where you couldn't see it before. Uh, also, in the middle of this image, you can see the basal ganglia. Uh, so this is another, another good image for seeing the basal ganglia, for seeing the contrast between gray matter and white matter. Okay, so those are some structures within the brain. Uh, but the brain is not a solid mass of neurons. In fact, it has holes in it. It has cavities uh, that are supposed to be there. Uh, and these cavities are filled not with air, uh, but with cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Uh, and so these cavities within the brain uh, hold this fluid, but this fluid uh, also, there, there's, there's sort of a drain, so it can get out of the brain as well. And the CSF is always being sort of recirculated. Uh, and so we, we've already seen uh, the glial cells that are responsible for this, uh, the ependymal cells that produce CSF. They line the ventricles and produce more CSF. You're always making more and recycling it. Uh, so this is a fluid that is inside the brain and also outside the brain. The brain is floating in a bath of cerebrospinal fluid. It does not sit in air. Uh, if it did, your brain would collapse under its own weight. Uh, so this is a, a fluid in which the brain is, is buoyant. Uh, so when you slice the brain, uh, whether it's coronal, whether it's horizontal, um, you, you, can, you will see uh, those ventricles, and those are supposed to be there. That is not a brain injury. Okay, so we have our geography. We know some parts of the brain. We know some directions. We know our anatomical planes. Uh, a brief word on development. Uh, we will really just talk about the adult brain in this course. Uh, you could spend an entire course talking about brain development, uh, but we're not, we're not going to do that. I'll spend really these two slides on brain development and that will be it. Um, so one thing, uh, this is a diagram of your book, uh, and it, it shows the sort of hierarchy of labels for the brain. You have terms like midbrain, hindbrain, forebrain, uh, and I won't use those terms much. I'll use the term midbrain every now and again. Uh, but you'll notice that, you know, the hindbrain is sort of toward the back, uh, but the forebrain, which the name makes it sound like it should be in the front, is, is on top. It's both the most forward and the most back, the backmost part. Uh, and, and so these names come from uh, where these things come from developmentally. So at the very beginning of development, uh, after just a couple of weeks, uh, your entire nervous system is basically a tube. Uh, and that's the fore, mid, and hind reference point. So that, that the front, middle, and back of that tube uh, is what gives rise to the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain, which eventually become uh, structures like the cortex and the basal ganglia, in the case of the forebrain, uh, the midbrain structures, which we're not really going to go into at this point, uh, and the hindbrain, like the cerebellum. Uh, so that's where those labels come from. And, and again, we're not going to focus on development much, uh, but the brain does have to develop, and it develops from something very simple into this very complex uh, structure with with some parts that look very different from one another. Cerebellum looks very different from the rest of the cortex, uh, has different cell types. Uh, and so these structures at first are undifferentiated, but as development occurs, uh, they start to exhibit their differences and they m exist in different locations. And the way that works uh, is based on local signaling molecules 
during early development. So on the top left here, uh, you see a cross section of that tube that is the developing nervous system. Uh, and during early development, this tube is just generating lots and lots of cells and the cells sort of swim out from the middle. They're created at the middle and they start going out toward the outside edge of that tube. Uh, and then they start to differentiate. They turn into different kinds of cells. Uh, some turn into neurons, some turn into glia. Uh, we know there are different kinds of neurons and there are different kinds of glia, so they differentiate farther even from there. Uh, and then the neurons that are there uh, generate lots of connections. It's called synaptogenesis. They start just connecting to anyone nearby. Uh, and not all those connections are useful. And not all those neurons are useful. And so neurons that aren't connected to anyone uh, or are redundant, uh, those go through cell death. It's normal for neurons to die during early brain development. Uh, in fact, neurons die throughout your lifespan. Uh, it's only when the, the numbers of cells dying is unusually high uh, that we start to become concerned. Uh, and so cells die and, and neurons lose their synapses. They start with lots of synapses to all their neighbors, but not all of those connections are useful. Not all of those neighbors need to be listened to. Uh, not all those neurons are doing the same thing. Uh, and so those synapses will gradually go away until uh, neurons are only connected to those neighbors they need to pay attention to. And so that is the broad overview of, of brain development. Uh, you have cells develop and spread out, they differentiate, they connect to their neighbors, and then the cells and connections that aren't useful go away. Okay, uh, the other big part of the central nervous system is of course the spinal cord. And so we see it here. And so we see different levels of the spinal cord on the left, cervical, that is up near the neck, thoracic, the chest area, lumbar in the lower back, and sacral uh, toward the tailbone. Uh, and on the right side of this diagram, we see sort of layer by layer what the spinal cord consists of. We of course see the vertebrae, the bones that make up your spine. And then within those bones is the spinal cord. The purpose of the spinal of, of the spine uh, is the backbone, uh, is, is to give the body structure, of course, but also to protect the spinal cord because the spinal cord doesn't have a lot of structural protection. Uh, and so it needs those vertebrae. Uh, and so if you look at this diagram, you'll notice there are multiple layers that cover and protect the spinal cord. And those layers together are called meninges. Uh, and the meninges are the boundary between the central uh, and peripheral nervous systems. The central nervous system has meninges, the peripheral nervous system does not. So as nerves leave the spinal cord, they lose those meninges. And there are three of them. Uh, they are the innermost, closest to the brain and spinal cord is called the pia mater. Mater is Latin for mother. Pia means soft. It's actually the same root in the musical instrument piano. Uh, so it means soft mother or tender mother. So it is a very fragile layer um, and, and it covers uh, the, the very sensitive surface of the central nervous system. Uh, then you have the arachnoid so named because there are these spider-like uh, blood vessels that go throughout it. And then on the outside, you have the dura mater. There's mater again, mother. Dura means hard or tough. So this is the tough mother of the meninges. Uh, and it is more like a garbage bag material. Uh, it is tough, it is pliable, it is hard to puncture, but not impossible. Uh, and so it is the most protective layer. Uh, the, the layers underneath, the pia mater and the arachnoid, uh, can supply nutrients uh, and fluid, uh, but the dura mater is, is the, really the, the sort of armor of the central nervous system. Uh, and so these three meninges cover the central nervous system, but not the peripheral. Uh, and you can see in this diagram that every now and again, uh, something will stick off of the spinal cord, and those are nerves. If you zoom in, uh, you see that nerves exit and enter the spinal cord at different points. Uh, on the dorsal side, that is toward the back, and now dorsal and ventral means toward the back and toward the stomach, so it's different from the brain because our brains are again turned 90 degrees. Uh, the dorsal roots uh, contain sensory information. 
Uh, and so they are going into the spinal cord. The ventral roots uh, are the neurons that are coming out of the spinal cord, and they contain motor information. Uh, so this is a cross-section of the spinal cord at a particular point, but you can see both the motor nerves leaving and the sensory nerves entering the spinal cord. So here's the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, a ganglion, as we'll see, is a collection of cell bodies. It is this bump that is just outside the spinal cord. Uh, and it is, it's, there's one for every nerve that exits, uh, so, excuse me, that enters the spinal cord, every uh, collection of sensory neurons sending information to the spinal cord has a dorsal root ganglion. We'll see why in just a minute. Uh, and you can go up and down the spinal cord, and again, these, these nerves are leaving between the vertebrae. Uh, so nerves leave the vertebrae uh, up in the neck, the cervical vertebrae, the thorax, the chest, the lumbar, the lower back. Uh, and this is a diagram from not from your book, but it shows you uh, what sort of function a person will lose if their spinal cord is severed at a particular height. Uh, because depending on the location vertically, uh, if the spinal cord is severed, information can't make it any farther down than that, and information from farther down can't make it up to the brain. Uh, and so the location of a spinal cord injury matters very much. Uh, if the spinal cord injury is in the neck, if it's a cervical injury, uh, then that is above the spinal nerves that, that correspond to the legs, but also the trunk of the body and the arms. And so that person will be able to move their head and neck, but not much else. Uh, if the injury is lower down, uh, they may be able to move their arms, but not their legs. Uh, and the farther down that injury is, uh, the better in terms of how much function will be retained. And this is true for sensory processing as well. Uh, touch information can't make it past a spinal cord injury, though the lines are severed. Uh, and so lower injuries result in less loss of function. Uh, okay, and with that, we're going to do a class exercise. Uh, so it's going to look like this diagram here at the bottom. Uh, so what you need to do is uh, you're going to wait for instructions. You're going to pause this video, uh, go do the exercise, and then come back and continue the video. Uh, so this is going to help you, again, familiarize yourself uh, with some neuroanatomy. Uh, so there will be instructions with the exercise as well, uh, but this is a horizontal slice of the brain. Uh, and as some of the other horizontal slices we've seen, uh, anterior is to the left, posterior is to the right. Uh, the right side of the brain is at the top of this diagram, the left side is at the bottom. So we've sliced it parallel to the floor, taken off the top part, and now we're looking from above. Uh, so the point of this exercise is to do your best labeling the locations in this diagram. Uh, this, is, this is difficult. Um, some of these locations we've gone over explicitly, others you'll have to dig for. Uh, but you can use your book, your notes, any other book, go to the internet, uh, whatever you want to do. Just do your best trying to complete this diagram. And I will be very impressed if you get all of them correct. Uh, but uh, some of these, again, should be, should be familiar. So do your best. And then pause the video, come back when you're done. Okay, I'll assume that you have done the exercise at this point. Proceed. Uh, so the leftmost portion is the frontal pole. This is the poles, just like the poles of the globe, uh, aren't a literal pole made out of a material. Uh, they just indicate the extreme ends. And so the frontal pole is the end of the frontal lobe. Uh, if you put, uh, if you thought this was white matter, you are also correct. Uh, so you, you, you get credit for that too. This is an exercise. You're not getting, being graded based on the correctness of your answers. Uh, moving on, the outermost layer here is, of course, the skin. Uh, this is what's called an MRI. You may have had an MRI before. Uh, but this is an image. It includes not just the brain, but the tissue surrounding the brain. So here's the skin. Here's the skull, this dark band. Uh, this sort of light colored band uh, are some of the meninges. Uh, it's the dura and the arachnoid. So the dura is the dura mater. Sometimes it's just called the dura. Uh, 
of this dark part within those meninges is cerebrospinal fluid. So the dura and the arachnoid uh, are not very tightly connected to the brain. The pia mater is. It's thin and it's right on the brain, so you can't see it here. Uh, but the cerebrospinal fluid surrounds the brain inside the meninges. Uh, this is a tough one. This is called the Falx cerebri. And this is where uh, the dura, the meninges, go into the longitudinal fissure. So this, we can see where the, where the cerebrospinal fluid dips into the brain from the right and separates the right hemisphere on top from the left hemisphere on bottom. And part of the meninges sort of go into that fissure. So that's what's called the Falx cerebri. Uh, this is the occipital pole. Uh, this is the rearmost part of the brain. Uh, it is the extreme end of the occipital lobe. Uh, this here is the sagittal sinus. And this is another tough one. Uh, it is where cerebrospinal fluid drains out. Uh, so it is, it is outside the meninges. Uh, and excess cerebrospinal fluid goes into the sinus, gets into the lymphatic system, and gets recycled. Not terribly important, but that's what this spot is. Uh, this is part of the lateral ventricle. Uh, and so those ventricles, again, are cavities within the brain. Uh, this happens to be the occipital end of the lateral ventricle. So you have uh, two lateral ventricles. Lateral means to the side. You have a left and a right. Uh, this happens to be the left lateral ventricle. Uh, and it's on the occipital end. Uh, here's the thalamus, that sensory routing center. Uh, you'll notice that in this brain, the two thalami are connected. There's this tiny little bridge between them. For some people, they're connected. For some people, they are not. It doesn't seem to matter. We don't know why. Uh, the globus pallidus, part of the basal ganglia, helps to regulate movement and control movement. Uh, the putamen, also part of the basal ganglia. And again, we're not going to really detail what individual part the basal ganglia do, uh, it's not important for our purposes, but that's where these structures are. And they are a large part of the brain, uh, so it's important to know that structures that control movement, process rewards, uh, are an important part of the brain. Uh, this is a band of white matter called the internal capsule. Uh, it transfers information across the brain. Again, not terribly important, but gives us some bearings, points out some white matter, uh, and emphasizes the fact that information has to get transferred across the brain. And the only way to do that is by sending neurons, myelinated neurons, across the brain. And then finally, we have the caudate in front here. It's in the front part of the basal ganglia. Uh, again, involved in reward processing and movement. Uh, okay, so that is our class exercise. Uh, hopefully, you got many of those. I don't expect that you got all of them. Uh, but the, the point of the exercise is to familiarize yourself with brain anatomy, to get some practice looking up what different regions are, where they are in the brain, uh, getting different perspectives on them. Because again, the brain is a three-dimensional object, and this is tough. It's tough to visualize, and so this gives you some good practice. Okay, going back to the spinal cord. Uh, if you look at the spinal cord, uh, if you slice it up near the top, up near the brain, uh, you'll notice that it is mostly white matter. Now, if you look at the very bottom, down near the hips, uh, it's mostly gray matter. Uh, so the fact is that as you go up, uh, the spinal cord contains more and more white matter. It also get, it gets bigger. Uh, and if you think about that, that makes a certain sense because whatever point you're at in the spinal cord, uh, that point of the spinal cord contains not only the neurons that are going to that particular location and exiting there, uh, but also everything that's going down below or coming up from down below. Uh, so it's sort of like a highway system uh, out in a rural area that corresponds to the bottom of the spinal cord. All that, that's mainly local traffic, right? There are some cars getting on that are going all the way downtown, some cars coming from downtown getting off, uh, but it's sort of the end of the line. Nothing's going beyond that, and so you don't need a bunch of extra lanes. Uh, if you get toward the middle of the spinal cord, the middle of our highway system metaphor, uh, then some of those people are exiting locally. Uh, some are going out to the rural area. Some are coming in from the rural area. So it's uh, an even mix of people that are just leaving or entering there uh, and people that are going to or coming from farther away. Uh, if you get to downtown in our highway system, the top of the spinal cord, uh, well, almost everyone 
is coming from somewhere else or going to somewhere else. Relatively few cars are going to be local, uh, going to be exiting or entering right there at that on-ramp. Similarly, uh, you have relatively little gray matter uh, because, remember, gray matter is local processing. And there's not a lot of local processing at this point in the spinal cord compared to all the information that's going to a distant or coming from a distant part of the nervous system. Uh, so that's why if you look at a cross-section of the spinal cord, you see this variation in gray matter versus white matter. Uh, so just to refresh our memories from the beginning of the lecture, uh, we have the central and the peripheral nervous system. And we've just covered the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. And now we're going to start dealing with that outer part, the peripheral nervous system, the part of the nervous system that the spinal cord is sort of a go-between for. It connects the brain to the peripheral nervous system. And one important thing that the spinal cord does and depends on the peripheral nervous system for uh, are reflexes. Uh, so these are dealt with by the spinal cord. Uh, and of course, when we say the term reflex, we think of something automatic, something inflexible, something we don't have control over. It is reflexive. Oh, I did it so quickly, it was a reflex. I didn't think about it and I didn't have control over it. And that's sort of an old view of what reflexes are. The, a uh, classic example, of course, is what's called the patella reflex. Uh, when you go for a checkup and the doctor taps just below your kneecap with that little rubber hammer, uh, what that's testing is your patella reflex. So what happens? Uh, well, when you get tapped on the knee like that, uh, your leg kicks out. Why? Uh, well, tapping that tendon, which is what that hammer is doing, uh, causes that muscle to stretch out causes your quadricep, your thigh muscle on top, um, to contract. It's going to stretch that muscle out. That muscle doesn't want to be stretched too far. And so as a reflex, it contracts some. Uh, so when you tap that tendon, the muscle avoids getting too long, getting pulled, uh, by contracting. And this is done uh, using both the peripheral nervous system and the spinal cord. So there's a sense organ called a muscle spindle. That name is not important. Uh, that senses when the muscle is getting too long and it's being stretched. It sends that information through a sensory neuron to the spinal cord. So information goes into the spinal cord. The spinal cord then sends out motor information. So here we have the sensory neuron bringing information into the spinal cord saying, hey, this muscle is getting too long. Uh, one thing that you have uh, is the activation of the quadricep muscle. So the muscle on the top part of the leg contracts. So that leg can kick out. That, that top muscle is going to pull on the kneecap uh, and the tendon attached to it, and it's gonna pull on the lower leg and kick that leg out. Uh, but of course, muscles exist in opposition. For every muscle you have, you have a muscle on the opposite side that opposes it. Otherwise, if you flexed your arm, for example, uh, if you did that once with your bicep, if you didn't have your triceps there, you could never straighten out your arm again. So you have one, arm, one muscle that contracts and another that extends. It flexes and extends. So contracting the quadriceps isn't enough. Uh, you have to relax the hamstring, the bottom part of the thigh muscle. And so you have a neuron in the spinal cord that is what's called inhibitory. It shuts down that other muscle. So it keeps that second neuron from sending any signals to the muscle. And so you get one muscle that contracts and the other muscle gets inhibited. It can't contract. And so you have one muscle pulling and the other relaxing. And so that's how you have the lower leg kicking out. And this is what gives us what we call the knee jerk reaction. When that phrase in our language means something automatic, something quick. Uh, and this is a classic example of an inflexible reflex. You can keep your leg from kicking out if you really try, uh, but you don't have much control over this. Uh, when we're talking about reflexes, there's, there's a couple of terms that are important to know. Uh, one is afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Uh, and so afferent means carrying information toward the central nervous system. So in this case, a sensory neuron is afferent. It carries information about the state of that muscle to the spinal cord, to the central nervous system. Uh, 
neurons that go to the brain from the spinal cord are also afferent because they're going toward the brain. Uh, so afferent means carrying information into the central nervous system. The opposite is efferent, sometimes pronounced efferent. I'll, I'll say efferent. Uh, and this is the opposite. It carries information away from the central nervous system. So the neurons that connect to muscles in our reflex example are efferent neurons. So it's important to know that distinction. Uh, so again, we have that old view of what reflexes are. They're, they're inflexible, you can't control them. Uh, and that again is an old view. Many reflexes, it turns out, uh, are a little more flexible than that. So the current view is that they are first adaptable. That means you don't exhibit exactly the same response, even given a similar stimulus. Uh, so this is not from your book, but this is an example of an experiment on a reflex. Uh, and the way this worked is they took a person's hand and they sort of put a ring around the thumb and, and clamped it to the table, not, not painfully. Uh, and they told the person just to tap their finger and their thumb together as quickly as they could. And then what they started doing was they would pull the thumb toward the table every now and again. Uh, and so what the person did was the person could still tap their finger and thumb together, no problem, uh, because there's information in the spinal cord uh, coming from the brain that says, hey, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to tap our finger and thumb together. So in case anything moves the thumb, just shift the finger accordingly. Uh, and so this is a reflex in the sense that it's information that the spinal cord deals with. The spinal cord uh, can make the forefinger tap the thumb without sending information all the way to the brain and getting it back. Uh, that would take too long. This finger tapping happens very quickly. Uh, and so we know that it's fast enough that the brain isn't involved in making every little adjustment to the forefinger anytime the thumb moves. Uh, so your spinal cord can adapt to incoming sensory information. Uh, it is not the same response given the same stimulus. Uh, they're also context dependent. So your spinal cord can basically hold information coming from the brain, uh, again, saying, what is it we're trying to do? What is the context? Uh, a very clever experiment. Again, this is not from your book. Uh, a person was sort of squatting down and they had one hand, in this case, their left hand, was holding uh, a bar. And the other hand, the right hand, was holding onto something else. And the something else changed between two versions of the experiment. Uh, in one version, uh, the left hand is holding that bar, and the right hand is bracing the person against a table. And suddenly the bar is pulled forward. And so the person would fall over if they didn't brace themselves against the table. And so their right arm pushes out. Reflexively, happens very fast, too fast for the brain to be involved. So effectively, the brain is telling the spinal cord, hey, if our left arm gets pulled, push with the right arm. That's the context we're in. Uh, in the other version, the right hand is holding not a table, but a cup full of coffee or some other liquid. And now the left hand gets pulled, and the right hand doesn't push. If it pushed, that would slosh out the coffee. The context uh, is that the person wants to keep the cup in the same position. They're not trying to keep their body in the same position. They want to make sure that cup doesn't move so they don't spill anything. Uh, and so the context is different and the response is different, even given the same stimulus, the same being, uh, state of being pulled forward by the left hand. Uh, and again, this happens too fast to involve the brain. So clearly this, the spinal cord is storing information about what the different parts of the body are trying to do. In the case on the left, brace against a solid surface. In the case on the right, relax and let that cup come toward you so it doesn't spill as you get pulled forward. Uh, so that's a relatively new view of reflexes, but it tells us uh, that our spinal cord does more processing and holds more information than we previously thought. And if you look at these diagrams of reflexes, uh, this is going to refer back to the types of neurons we saw in our unit on neurons. Uh, and so we have these two diagrams we've already seen previously. Uh, the sensory neurons that are bringing information from sense organs to the spinal cord uh, are unipolar neurons. If we remember that term, we have the cell body uh, and a single projection off that cell body that then splits into dendrites and axons. Uh, and so this is what the type of neuron that sensory neurons are. So here, 
we see sort of a cartoon version of that cell body. We see it in this diagram as well, that little sort of bud that sticks off of the sensory neuron. Uh, well, of course, you have lots of sensory neurons. It's not just one that comes off the spinal cord at a time. Uh, and so these cell bodies collect together, and that's what forms the dorsal root ganglion. A ganglion is a collection of cell bodies. Uh, and so these sensory neurons that are bringing information to the, toward the spinal cord, uh, their cell bodies are collected together. They're not scattered along the whole nerve. They're all in one spot. And that one spot collects all the cell bodies, and those cell bodies collectively uh, have enough volume that they make this bulge, this sort of bump, this ganglion. So that's what the dorsal root ganglion is. It is the collection of cell bodies of the sensory neurons. So that's, if we break this term down, a ganglion is a collection of cell bodies. Dorsal means toward the back. And the roots are the nerves that exit the spinal cord. So it is the dorsal roots, the sensory neurons, and it is the collection of their cell bodies. Uh, other nerves come off the spinal cord and, frankly, the brainstem. Uh, and these are called the cranial nerves. So they don't come out between vertebrae. Uh, they come off the top part of the spinal cord and the brainstem. Uh, and so these are part of the peripheral nervous system, uh, with the exception of what are called the olfactory and optic nerves that deal with your sense of smell and your vision, respectively. Uh, and the point of this diagram is not to memorize the names of the various cranial nerves, certainly not to memorize the numbers that go with those names. Uh, the point here is just to realize uh, that information goes directly into the brain, goes directly into the brain stem, uh, and also that this information can be both sensory and motor. Some cranial nerves are just sensory information, uh, some are just motor information. Uh, you have several nerves that correspond to your tongue, for example, both sensing uh, touch on the tongue and taste, and also moving it for speech. So that's what the cranial nerves do. We're not going to belabor that. We'll go into more of them in our unit on the senses, but that's all I'll say for now. Uh, talking about the peripheral nervous system, the peripheral nervous system does more than just handle reflexes, of course. Uh, it handles all of your body's processes, uh, contracting your muscles, sensing the environment around you, uh, controlling your internal organs. And when it comes to that latter part in particular, uh, that's the autonomic nervous system, the stuff that happens automatically that controls your bodily functions. Uh, and your autonomic nervous system consists of two opposing systems called the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, and the sympathetic nervous system is, if you've heard the term fight or flight mode, that is what the sympathetic nervous system does. It gets you active, gets you ready for action. Uh, fight or flight uh, is when you have both an emotional and a physiological response uh, to something surprising, something perhaps dangerous. Uh, when something stresses you, you go into fight or flight mode. Your sympathetic nervous system becomes active uh, and it does a number of things. Uh, it dilates your pupils, it opens up your airways, it increases your heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, it shuts down your digestive and reproductive systems. Uh, why? Well, because if you're reacting to a predator, if you're trying to run away, you're trying to get into combat, uh, you don't need to worry about digesting food right now. Uh, you don't need to worry about reproduction. Uh, and so those are in, your immune response is also suppressed. Uh, so your energy is diverted toward your muscles and your senses uh, because you need to deal with whatever threat that is. Uh, so that is the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. It's what's called often rest and digest. Uh, so it constricts your airways, it slows down your heart, constricts your pupils, uh, and activates your digestive and, and immune systems. Uh, so this is when you're relaxed. This is when you're not under a threat. Uh, and you need both of these systems. You wouldn't want to be in fight or flight mode all the time, but you also wouldn't want to be in rest and digest mode if there's a threat around the corner or in front of you. Uh, so these systems are, are very important. We'll come back to them uh, when we talk about psychoactive drugs, uh, when we talk about emotions, uh, when we talk about hormones and sexual behavior. Uh, so that is part of the peripheral nervous system. It's called the autonomic nervous system. Uh, and it gets our bodies and our nervous systems ready uh, for whatever context we're currently in. Okay, so, so now we have the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. Uh, and of course, these things can get injured. Uh, 
Uh, and so how does the nervous system repair itself? Uh, well, if we look at the level of individual neurons, uh, a common way for neurons to be injured, especially large neurons that have long axons, is for that axon to get severed, and that's called an exotomy, especially if it's done on purpose. Down at the bottom here, we see uh, a scalpel that has severed this axon. And so now the axon terminals and the, and the lower part of that axon are separated from the cell body. Uh, and the axon end usually degenerates. The cell body has a lot of uh, important machinery up to it, including the nucleus with DNA. Uh, and now nothing can reach the axon terminal. Uh, and so the cell body can survive without the axon terminal. The axon terminal cannot survive without the cell body. And so it degenerates, it breaks up, and there's debris left over. Uh, the cell body often survives, uh, but changes in some subtle ways. Well, I'm, I'm not going to belabor that. Uh, but the cell body, for reasons I don't think we, we currently know, uh, the cell body shifts off to the side. We don't know what the purpose of that is, uh, but it changes structurally as well. Uh, and when it comes to repairing a neuron that has been severed, uh, sometimes a neuron will regrow its axon, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it just forms sort of a stump. Uh, and the difference there is whether the neuron we're looking at is in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. Uh, remember that both the peripheral and the central nervous systems can have myelinated neurons. Uh, but as we'll see, something about the quality of that myelin is different between the two. Also, the central nervous system has glial cells, has glia, uh, that do jobs like immune response in the central nervous system uh, that the regular old immune system handles in the peripheral. Uh, so there are differences in the types of cells that are present and there's differences in the chemical makeup of the myelin. Uh, so with reference to the glia, uh, here we see microglia, and they're going in, they're going to have an immune response. Uh, astrocytes also have a role when it comes to injury, and they're present in the central nervous system, but not the peripheral. So the per peripheral nervous system is really pretty good at healing itself. If you have nerve damage out in a limb, there's a good chance you can recover from that, at least partially. Uh, damaged neurons in the central nervous system don't. Uh, and, and we go back to Ramoni Cajal, our famous sort of first neuroscientist, our first neuroanatomist at least. Uh, and he, there's a famous quote from Ramoni Cajal. And of course, he's working at the beginning of the 20th century. And he said, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated when it comes to the central nervous system. Uh, so injuries, you can't recover from in the central nervous system. Uh, so if you look for this diagram, uh, on the left is the peripheral nervous system. And if the axon gets cut, as we see here in the middle panel of the left, uh, on the lower panel, you can see that that axon is regrowing. It's going to find its way back through the myelin and end up connecting to those neighbors again. In the central nervous system, that axon gets cut, and the myelin degenerates, the axon degenerates, and you have a bunch of glia coming in. Microglia, uh, you have astrocytes, and it forms what's called a glial scar. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason you have scars in general, they are not, they don't look the same as your original skin, uh, but they form quickly and they're there to prevent infection from getting in. And so it's a balance between quick healing uh, and getting the body back to the state it used to be in. And so when it comes to scars and glial scars are no exception, uh, the body is healing itself as quickly as it, as it can to prevent infection. Uh, it doesn't worry so much about whether it will regain its original appearance or function. And so the difference here is between Schwann cells, which is what the peripheral nervous system has, and oligodendrocytes, which is what the central nervous system has. They both create myelin, but the chemical makeup of that myelin seems to be different. And again, the central nervous system has these astrocytes that form a glial scar along with microglia, uh, and the peripheral nervous system doesn't. So both of those differences seem to dictate why the PNS can heal itself and the CNS can't. And of course, a lot of research is being done to try and turn that around, to be able to turn on the healing properties of the central nervous system. Uh, and so Ramoni Cajal also said that it is for the science of the future to change this harsh decree. Uh, basically saying, hopefully there's something we can do about that so that the central nervous system can heal itself.
Uh, now you don't want the central nervous, central nervous system sending out axons just willy-nilly all over the place. Uh, you don't want it making connections that it shouldn't be making. Uh, and so the CNS strikes a balance between overgrowth and healing slowly uh, and repairing quickly, even at the expense of losing function. Uh, and so the hope is that at least locally, we can do something, uh, apply a chemical, do some gene therapy local to the injury so that it acts more like the PNS, less like the CNS, at least temporarily. Uh, and the question, so how do we know this? Uh, the question is whether it's really the neurons, is it something about the neurons of the central and peripheral nervous system, or is it the environment they inhabit? And so some researchers did a very clever experiment. Uh, they took part of the peripheral nervous system, they took a nerve, and they took the optic nerve, which is part of the central nervous system. It's one of our cranial nerves. Remember, the cranial nerves are part of the PNS, except for the olfactory and optics. Uh, so they severed the axons, and then they switched the environments. Uh, they took the sort of myelin and the environment surrounding where the axon used to be uh, from the peripheral and optic nerves and switched them. The optic nerve environment went to the peripheral nerve and the peripheral nerve environment went to the optic nerve and they waited to see which, if any, would regrow. Normally the optic nerve doesn't regrow, but if you let that axon go through a peripheral nerve environment, including the myelin, it does. Uh, and so it's not the inherent properties of the neurons themselves. The neurons themselves are normal neurons. Uh, they will regrow if you let them. It's something about the environment, the myelin, the mixture of glia. Uh, and so this was a critical experiment in understanding that it's the environment and not the neurons uh, that makes the difference between the CNS and the PNS healing itself. Uh, so again, we have spinal cord, we have optic nerves, uh, and the spinal cord connects to these peripheral nerves and they have different environments so that when you cut them, uh, they normally regrow in the peripheral nervous system as we see here and don't regrow in the optic nerve as you see on the right. But if you cut out the environments and switch them, now the peripheral nerve doesn't grow back and the optic nerve, part of the central nervous system, does. So it's the environment that the neuron inhabits, not the properties of the neuron itself. Uh, and so myelin, central nervous system myelin, actually seems to inhibit regrowth. This is another piece of data uh, that, tell, that explains what's going on. Uh, so on the left, you have a normal spinal cord. Uh, in the middle, it gets severed. An injury occurs. And if the spinal cord is rich in myelin, as it usually is, those neurons won't regrow, which is unfortunate because spinal cord injuries uh, are very severe. They can cause severe loss of function. And so you want those neurons to regrow, but they won't regrow through that central nervous system myelin. In the, on the right, uh, this is from mice that have been irradiated. Radiation has destroyed the myelin in the spinal cord. And now those neurons have no trouble regrowing. Now, this is not a treatment option because removing the myelin causes all sorts of other problems. Uh, so this is not a solution for spinal cord injury. Uh, but it does demonstrate that something about the myelin in particular uh, is preventing regrowth of these neurons. Okay, so we saw a, a number of things today. Again, we have a little more content today than we usually do. Uh, we saw how the cortex is organized. Lobes, gyri, sulci, uh, different parts, different functions, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, uh, handling, reasoning and planning, attention and sensory integration, vision and hearing, respectively, uh, we got some coordinates. We got our bearings. Uh, so we have anatomical planes, uh, viewpoints from which we can view the brain, uh, and directions, anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, superior, inferior, medial, lateral. And so we have those directions now as well. Uh, we have some subcortical structures underneath the cortex. We have the basal ganglia, we have the limbic system, we have the thalamus, for example. Uh, and so those are all parts of the brain as well, and they're very important. They have their jobs too. Uh, 
Uh, we talked about the spinal cord, the cranial nerves, uh, what they do, how they're built, what their structure is. Uh, one example, reflexes. Uh, and we saw how reflexes uh, involve the transfer of information from sensory systems into the spinal cord out to motor neurons. So we got some more terminology there. Uh, but we also saw a very basic way that information is processed, that you get from stimulus to response. And we wrapped up by looking at how the nervous system repairs itself. Uh, the PNS has a much easier time than the CNS does. Uh, research is ongoing to try to change that, at least temporarily at the site of an injury. Uh, but the environment of the CNS is fundamentally different. And that seems to cause differences in the healing capacity of the CNS and PNS. Okay, that will do it for our unit on the central and peripheral nervous systems. Uh, so be sure to take the online quiz. As always, it's a required part of the course. Uh, go back, you can look back at this lecture, your notes, the book, uh, whatever you like. Just make sure you take that quiz by Friday night. Uh, and then to get ready for next time, uh, do the reading. Uh, so do the reading before lecture. And this will be about ions and ion channels. So we're starting to get into neural function. We're going to go back to the very small scale and talk about the environment that neurons are sitting in and how they send signals from one end of the neuron to the other. Uh, and for many of you, this may have been, uh, it may have been a while since you had biology or chemistry class. Uh, that's okay. We're going to re-familiarize you with, that, with those ideas. Uh, but it's all the more important that you do the reading prior to lecture. Uh, so those are all things on your to-do list. Uh, that will do it for this time. I will see you next time.